this up here. Right, so just uh, whilst you're waiting for people to sit down and relax, here's a piece of code for you to think about. And the question is very simple, what is the output? I'm doing a for each on a parallel stream. Uh, what will the output be? <laughs> yeah, JavaScript's undefined. Well, Java's also kind of going to have some challenges here. All right. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're going to look at how to get a bit more performance out of, out of, our, out of our system. Um, up to now, we've been, we've been very fortunate because we've got so much chip-level parallelism happening, instruction-level parallelism, that, um, that we haven't really had to care too much about multi-threading and, multi and, and parallelism on the software side. It's been taken care of for us on the hardware side and by the compilers. But um, as, as the hardware guys are reaching more and more their limit, we need to help a bit. And um, what we're looking at here is, is a graph. This is a, an Intel i7. It's my, my laptop. Um, uh, it's a four-core machine. And um, you can see that I've got the, the cores 0, 2, 4, and 6 are, are the real cores, but it's a hyper-threaded um, socket. So you can see sort of the, the uh, core, cores 1, 3, 5, and 7 um, are not as busy, but that's not the real core. Um, so what you can also notice here is that there's not a lot of red. Now, red is normally quite a bad sign. We have a lot of red inside your CPU graphs. Um, but what you also notice at the beginning of the, of the run, there's quite a bit of black. So the black is um, a problem because we're not fully utilizing the CPUs. Now, what I did was um, I used fork join to parallelize some number crunching, and we'll do that in a live demo in a moment. And um, what I did is I also added, I had some blocking code, and I added a managed block into that, and I got this code. This, this, uh, this run afterwards. So you can see the beginning of the run is now a lot more green. There's not so much black at the beginning. Um, once, once the algorithm gets going, um, it's, it's fine. We're utilizing all the available cores. But at the beginning, um, we were stuck for a while um, trying to utilize the available uh, hardware that's there. And, um, and overall, it also got, it became 8% faster. So there was um, quite a difference from before versus to the end. Okay, so how do we get there? Um, one of the examples I like to use is Fibonacci because it's something which is quite difficult to calculate. It becomes a very large number, but you could take anything. You could work out the digits of pi, of e, anything which takes a long time and needs lots of processing power. Predict the weather, simulate nuclear bombs, whatever you want to do. Um, uh, mine bitcoins, whatever you want to do. So, um, this, this, number, this number sequence is very easy to understand. If f of naught is naught, f of 1 is 1, and then f of n is the previous two numbers added together. Now, this becomes large very quickly. So uh, Australia had the problem with rabbits exploding uh, in population. <laughs> I think they're exploding in different ways now. But uh, they were exploding in population growth because rabbits have more rabbits, and those rabbits have more rabbits. So, so you have this exponential growth of rabbits. And so the numbers get very large. And um, you might see some people implement this as follows. You simply write the function f, where if n is less or equal to 1, we return n. Otherwise, you say return f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Now, the computational time complexity of this function is actually in itself a Fibonacci series. So f of n will take as long as f of n plus one, uh, minus 1 plus the time of f of n minus 2 added together. So it's itself a Fibonacci series. And um, so it takes a very long time. Um, and um, I remember seeing, uh, seeing this formula actually inside a Java performance book. I won't mention the name, but it was written inside the book. And they had something like, if you want to work at Fibonacci 100, and you can't, not in our lifetime, could you ever calculate Fibonacci 100 with this algorithm. Okay. Um, now, Another way to do it is to simply have an iterative algorithm where we don't, we don't work out the previous values over and over again, but rather 
um, we only we iterate through from rot up to n, and we only need to, to work out each number a single time. Now, this has linear time complexity, and um, so if you want to work out Fibonacci billion, you do that like in a second. But long overflows pretty quickly, because long only goes up to about Fibonacci 60, 70, 80, somewhere around there, and then you're going to go to negative numbers. And so the answer will be fast, but it, will be, it won't be correct. So that's not very good. If, you, if you're happy with the wrong answer, I can just tell you the number 42, and then, you know, I'm done. I'm, I'm even faster than 1.7 seconds. Um, so we want to have something which is correct. Of course, you could use big integer, but big integer's add function is also linear. So you've got a linear algorithm, and each of the adds is also linear. So you've got linear times linear gives you quadratics. So you end up like a quadratic uh, performance. So, it's, it's, so for small numbers, it, this will work. Say, for example, if you're not sure of a million, you'll get a, with a, within a reasonable amount of time, you'll get an answer. But if you're not sure of one billion, it will simply take too long. So here's another formula called Dijkstra's sum of squares. This is a very clever formula. Um, and um, it's basically at, at every point um, divides the number of, of, of numbers you have to, have to calculate by two. So um, the, the actual algorithm has logarithmic time complexity, but then if you'd multiply, the multiply also is a factor. So we've got um, the multiplying big integer used to be quadratic, order n to the power of two. Um, this was in the, in the bad old days, before Java 8, um, and they improved this in Java 8, now they've got two different algorithms. The one is called Karatsuba. How many of you have heard of Karatsuba? Well, it's, good to say. it's actually more than most people. Right? That, that's actually quite a good number. Um, and Karatsuba, what they do is they split the number in two halves, and they multiply the top with the other one's bottom, and then the other one's uh, top with this one's bottom. And then they do some, some magic, and they end up with the, the correct number. Right? I don't really know how it works, but that's sort of how it works. Um, now. What they do is, if the, if the number is relatively small, then they just do the, the old traditional uh, quadratic multiplication. But if it's bigger than some threshold, they take Karatsuba because it has a lower computational time complexity of n to the power of 1.585 rather than n to the power of 2. Now, when you look at the, that, you might think, well, what's the big deal? n to the power of 2, n to the power of 1.585, why bother it's, it's still like more than one, right? But it's a massive difference once the numbers get bigger. It really, the time it takes is much, much longer. And um, another question you might ask is, why don't we always take Karatsuba? And, and the reason is that the, 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 the cost to set it up is, um, exceeds the benefit if the number is not big enough. So if it's bigger than some threshold, it's worthwhile to, to pay the cost, the setup cost of going for Karatsuba. Um, and then there's another one called the three-way Tum Cook. Now, I sort of understand Karatsuba, but I do not understand Tum Cook. That's like splitting into five different sections, lots of shifting and multiplying and all sorts of magic, and in the end, out pops the answer. Hopefully, it's correct. Um, and the complexity is even less than Karatsuba. So basically, if the number's small enough, we take the quadratic. If it's a bit big, but not too big, we take Karatsuba. And if it's really big, we take the Tum Cook. Now, um, the big integer at the moment is still single-threaded. We will fix that a little bit later. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to do, uh, I'm going to do this as a series of, de uh, of, of demos, and um, I need your help. I need you to, to please remind me, because when I'm coding, I often forget to commit to my changes. Right? <laughs> How many of you do that? I'm sure you will, will sometimes forget to commit. So um, if I forget to commit, please remind me to commit each demo. So each demo I want to commit into GitHub, and um, if you want to get to the GitHub directory, you can put your name in there, get my newsletter, and you can also get directly linked to the GitHub directory. Um, and we're going to implement this algorithm using big integer. Unfortunately, we don't have operator overloading in Java, so it's going to look a bit ugly, but uh, I'm sure you're used to that from coding in Java. It looks ugly, right? Um, so this is the first demo. What we want to do is we want to um, to code the following, we're going to say int half equals n plus 1 divided by 2. And um, then we want to work out 
um, half minus one and half just half. So it's going to be um, big integer f naught equals um, f of half minus one, and f of one is just f of half. And then if n is a is an odd number, so if n percentage two is is one, then return the square of f naught add it to the square of f1. Okay. Now, there is actually a square function in big integer, but it's not public. But if you multiply a number by itself, it automatically applies a square. So we, we're good with that. Else, if it's even, we're going to say this other formula over here. We're going to multiply f of n minus 1 by 2. So we're going to say return f naught dot shift left by 1. Let's multiply by 2. Add to that f1 and multiply the whole lot with f1. And if, we, if I did this correctly, then it should now give me the answer for each of these different, different values. So let's run this. And hopefully, everything is done correctly. I've sneakily set up the GC parameters so that we don't get any full GCs whilst doing this test. Now, just whilst this is running, I did an estimate that if you took the other formula, the, the first formula that we had, and you ran Fibonacci 1000, I estimated it would take approximately 10 to the power of 200 years to complete. Right? <laughs> That's quite a long time. I've got like 50 minutes, 47 minutes left. So that wouldn't work in a presentation. Okay. So it's running now, and, and we got it down to 3 milliseconds from 10 to the 200 years down to 3 milliseconds. That's not bad. That's not bad. And you, you normally, you always get your best performance improvements um, with, with an improved algorithm, reducing your computational time complexity. Okay, so this is not doing the 100 million. It takes a bit longer, um, but we, we do want to make this particular run faster. So we we'll just see, ooh, that's 51 seconds. So what we're going to do... I'm going to be very sneaky, and I'm going to stop for one moment here, and I'm going to do something which, which tends to make this whole thing faster. Okay? <laughs> Seriously, I'm going to do this. I'm going to restart quickly. Come on, restart. Because otherwise we don't, we don't have a good basis to start from. So what I found with this, with this test, when you reboot your machine, especially after it's been hibernated a few times and it's flown from South Africa to here without restarting, so... You need to just restart it. And uh, once it's restarted, we'll, we'll run it. And most probably, it'll actually shave off like five seconds or so just by restarting your machine, getting everything to low memory. So that, that's, of course, it'll benefit. Now, that's, it's going to start up in a moment. And then we'll run the test once more. I've never done it this way. Sort of reboot just to make the test faster. But it, it does tend to, to work. OK, so. Um, Start this up again. And hopefully now it's going to beat that 50 seconds. Um, okay. And presentation mode. Hopefully there's not too much other stuff running at the same time. Um, and uh, we'll see how well we perform on the 100 million. Um, okay, so the 100 million is, is a number which is, which, is, which is quite good for a demo over here because it's, it's, it doesn't run for like 10 minutes or 15 or 20 minutes, right? But it also doesn't show the improvements of the managed block as strongly as a bigger number. So I'm just warning you that, that in the end, the last improvement might not be as good as it is if you take a very big number. Okay, let's see if we actually improve it by rebooting or make it worse. Because um, I'm also doing other, it's still starting up and, you know. Uh, come on now. Hundred million. Okay, so we've improved it a bit. We've got a good basis, 47.5 seconds. And this is our Demo one. So I'm going to quickly commit that. 
minus a, dimmer one. And um, next, we're going to try uh, the following. At the moment, the, um, the, the, everything's running single-threadedly. And what I'll do is I'll run it with top, so you can see, or in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll run it with the, with the task manager, so you can see that it's running single-threadedly. So the, here's our CPU. And uh, CPU load, this is all the CPUs, CPU history. And when I run it, you'll see that, that it's running, um, it's really just running with, with, a single, with a single thread. It's a single threaded test. Um, so th there's lots of black in the graph, not very much green. Okay, let's stop that. And um, in fact, I'll keep it in the background. What we want to do next is to, um, is to parallelize the Fibonacci algorithm. See, at the moment, everything's doing single three, but what we want to do is we want to fork off um, the one half of the calculation. So the way this works is with divide and conquer. Each calculation is forked in half, forked in half, forked in half, and um, this is going to potentially create thousands of tasks that are going to then run in parallel with a maximum of eight threads running at once. So the, the way we do it is we, we create a recursive task, um, and what the recursive task does is it, is it calls f of half minus one, and that potentially can be run in a separate thread. It might be run with a current thread, or it might be run in a separate thread. You don't know, you don't care. So we fork that task off, and then we work out the, the other half, f of half, and then after we join with the first task again. Now, at the moment, it's running at 47 seconds. So what you can think about whilst I'm doing this is how fast would it be once I've done it, once I've parallelized it. So here's our, um, I, want, I want to basically parallelize this over here, Fibonacci f f naught equals f of half minus one. So we're gonna say recursive task of big integer, um, f naught task equals new recursive task, and I'm inside the compute function, I'm going to return this calculation from before. Then we get to say f naught task dot fork, and afterwards I'm going to say, after I've worked out f of half, I'm going to say f naught task dot join, like so. So just by doing this, I'm parallelizing the actual algorithm, the actual um, Fibonacci Dijkstra sum of squares. Without needing to really understand the algorithm, I can, I can still parallelize it. So let's run this again and um, watch what happens with our CPU graph. So it's running, all the cores are running, this is great. So it's going to be twice as, uh, four times as fast, so eight times as fast. So it's really good, really good, right? Um, and then something happens. You can see that the, the graph drops down and down and down. So it starts off very well, but then after not too long, um, it goes down to 400% down to 200%, and then eventually down to 100%, and um, it's eventually going to do the calculation still single-threadedly. So you can see that the performance is um, about twice as fast. You, 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 we want it to be four times as fast, but it's only about twice as fast. And um, at the beginning of the run, it's running very nicely in parallel, but towards the end, it's not. Any ideas why? Why would it towards the end not run in parallel? I beg your pardon? So I, I can't hear. I, I, still, I still can't hear. You need to shout because I can't hear. <laughs> yes. Okay, so remember that you have lots of tasks. So each of the, because we're splitting, 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 splitting. And the effect you're getting is a very typical effect that you have when you have a, a, a recursive decomposition where you're, you, you're, you're splitting and then merging back together again. So what's happening is that the, the last few multiplications are effectively done with a single thread when you're merging it back together again. So, so we do have lots of tasks, 
lots and lots of tasks, but we've got the final values. They, they, they have to be pushed back together. And I just want to move this, um, this result over to the other class over here. And then we're going to see demo two. And um, that, there we go. So the final merge is where the problem is. And if you, if you run top, for example, sort by CPU, you'll see it again. So run this. Oop. There we go. And um, so top, you can see it's like hundreds of percent. But then after not too long, it goes down to 400%. And then down to 200%, and then eventually down to 100% after not too long. And if I now go and I press the, the camera button, which shows me what the threads are doing, you can actually see that there's, there's only a single thread, the main thread, which is doing anything useful. So everybody else is waiting, time waiting, 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 except for the last one, the main thread, which is actually doing a multiplication. So it ends up being single threadedly. So this is our second demo. Um, let me quickly uh, check that in before I forget. Commit minus a demo two. OK. So the, the problem that we have is that we are spending lots of time on the multiplication. But we can also parallelize that. right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take big integer, and I'm going to copy that into my own package. In fact, I'm going to use the Java math package. I'm going to create a Java math package, copy big integer into that package, and then we're going to change that, make it parallel. Now, what I used to do in the past is that when I first started doing this demo, is I used to, I used to put big integer into my own package, with my own package name. And um, I was very surprised when I noticed that when you put it into the Java math package, it runs faster. Okay, so it's faster if it's in Java math than if it's in your own package name. All right? Any ideas why? Very good. Intrinsics. Excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, put it, um, we're going to copy it, we're going to change it, and then we're going to change the boot class path to point to our hacked Java math big integer. Okay, let's do that. So that's our third demo. Um, and to do that, we go to big integer. Now, um, I went to talk about clean code just now. I I'll teach you how to write lots of code in a very short amount of time. There's a letter, c command A, control C, all right? Then you go to the package control V, and you've just written like 2,000 lines of code. You get a bonus for lots of code. There we go. So um, there's a big integer. And just to make sure that this actually is using the correct big integer, I'm going to print out something when the class is loaded. So I'm going to say here, using hacked big integer. Okay. Now, at the moment when I run it, it won't use that. So you won't see using hacked big integer. It doesn't, doesn't say that. But if I start up my program, and, and one, of this, one of the parameters is minus x boot class path, and I say slash p, which is prepend, so prepend with my hacked path, then it uses the hacked Java math big integer. So now, it's, you can see they're using hacked big integer. So now, well, now I've confirmed that I'm actually going to use my own version of the big integer. OK. Now, um, let's go to the, the tomb cook. So tomb cook, it's the multiply tomb cook. And um, I don't know how this algorithm works at all. Right, there's, I'm, it's a complete mystery to me. The Karatsuba I did understand. I sort of figured out how it works, but this stuff I've got no clue. Right, it's some, it's real magic going on here, and um, I don't want to understand it because um, you don't need to understand it in order to and still be able to parallelize it. So what I'm going to do is, you can see there are five multipliers: one, two, three, four, five. I, the way my the way I would do it is I always want to um, to join before I do the next fork. So I'll do one fork, and I'll do compute with the, with, the, with the current thread, and then I'll join with the first thread, I'll join the first fork, then I'll do the second fork. So th this is the way that, that it works, so we don't have an explosion of, of threads being created here. 
So I'm going to make a multiply task. Multiply task. Um, v naught task equals new multiply task. And it's going to be A naught comma B naught, right? Um, I don't know what these things are. They need to know. I'm making an inner class, and this is going to be big integer A and big integer B, and then um, this is going to be extends recursive task of big integer, like that. We'll just put those into fields A and B, and then in the compute function, we just return A dot multiply with the B. Okay, very simple. Then we go to, we also write something very similar called a square task, because we, need, we will need that as well, with only a, an A, not a B. And um, then here, we can simply say A dot square, like that, okay? So two different recursive tasks, one for multiply and one for square. Let's go back to where we were. Um, after creating the V naught task, we're going to say V naught task dot fork. I want to point out, I don't know how this algorithm works at all. Maybe someone, one of you does, but I don't. So, um, and then before we do V1, we're going to say V naught equals um, V naught task dot join. All right, um, we're going to do the same thing for V1. And if I make a mistake, please help me. Um, it's easy to make mistakes on these things if you don't pay too much attention. DA1, comma DB1. Uh, that's V1 task. That would be two, two, uh, then V1 task dot fork. Uh, this one I'm going to do the other two multipliers, and afterwards I'm going to say V1 equals V1 task dot join. So I've got the V1 and the V0 as separate tasks, multiply tasks, recursive tasks. Now, the cool thing here is that um, because I'm just making a recursive task and forking it, it's actually going to be done with a common fork join pool. I don't have to specify which pool to use. You can also specify which pool to use, but in this case, it's just going to use a common one. Let's look at, let's do the same thing for the square to cook. And I'm not doing karatsuba because um, I'm looking for the big numbers. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to parallelize anything that's too small. You want to take, get, only do the big work like that. So here's square tomb cook. It's the same principle. Um, it's going to be a square task. V naught task equals new square task of A naught. Um, v naught task dot fork. And then before I do the third square, I'm going to say V naught equals V naught task dot join the same thing for v1 task equals new square task of da1 and uh, v1 task dot fork and then last it's going to be v1 equals uh, v1 task dot join like so now if everything goes correctly we should improve our performance it should be faster okay okay let's see and um, I'm going to run top at the same time. We have top running here. And top is showing us that our processes are actually quite busy, right? I only really have four cores, so um, I'm... I'm uh, and it also was a bit faster, I think. I think it completed faster as well. So our performance now for the 100 million was 12.8 seconds, which is a definite improvement over what we had in the previous run. That's our demo, our demo three. Now, um, any, any questions? No questions? You need to shout. Oh, yes? Are there another two? I think there's one more. Okay, uh, we, we'll have a look at that in a second. Um, just give me one moment. I'll put this, write this down. Demo three, this over here. Okay, so let's see. I'm in the right place. Um, oh, I think I might have gone to the wrong one. Um, 
this one. Uh, square. Okay, you said there were two more squares. There's one square here, V naught task, which we're forking. One, two squares, three squares, four squares, five squares. Where do you see another two? I might have missed it. I think there are only five. Okay. Um, now, obviously, if it's five, it's not an even number, so you're not going to be able to, to do the, the perfect divide and conquer, right? But it's going to be, it's pretty close, and, and, and we're getting quite good performance. And we're keeping our CPUs busy. Now, what I want to do is I want to, um, to, to run this once more. I will check it in a moment, but before I do that, I want to, to print out how long each of the different multipliers actually takes. So let's put a try finally around that. And um, we're going to do this. We're going to say long time if n is bigger than 1,000. So we're only going to look at bigger numbers. Or let's make it 10,000 because 1,000 is also very fast. Um, then I'm going to say um, system.currenttimemillies. Otherwise, I'm going to just set it to zero. So what I want to do is I want to, to measure how long this takes, but I'm going to need to look at numbers that are bigger than a certain number. So um, this would be minus time, otherwise to zero. And if time is bigger than, say, for example, 30 milliseconds, then print out, we're going to print out um, um, f of whatever it is, took percentage d percentage n for new line, and it's going to be n comma the time. So you can print out how long each of them actually took. So let's run that and see if you notice anything. As the numbers fly past, see if you spot anything. Do you notice anything here about the numbers? Yeah, exactly. So some of them are duplicates. This one is worked out like three times. And um, so some of them get worked out many times, not just once. There's lots of duplication. So um, before I show you the explanation for that, I want to, I want to commit this because this is now demo three. Okay. So um, I was sitting in the plane early on trying to figure out how to, how to show this, how to visualize this for you. So I started with Fibonacci 1 million, and I started drawing a graph of what, what other Fibonacci numbers you need to calculate to calculate Fibonacci of 1 million. Not 1 billion, 1 million. So you start with Fibonacci 1 million at the top, and in order to get that, you need Fibonacci 49999 and 500,000. To work out 49999, you need 249999 and 250,000. And to work out 500,000, you need the same two numbers. Okay? And this carries on. So, for example, level 5, you're going to 16 times work out the number Fibonacci 31,249. And it gets worse. At level 6, 14, you've got almost 8,000 times the number 60 getting, getting calculated and um, 8,192 times the number 61 being calculated. So there's lots and lots of duplication of the same numbers over here. Um, and it's, it's just the nature of this particular algorithm. That, um, and something else that's interesting is that they're always at the same level, right? So, um, and we'll see that effect um, happening in the, in the demo after the next one. So this next demo is to cache the results. So instead of doing the, the same numbers over and over again, we just, we just put them into a cache. We don't have to work them out um, if it's there really. Now, we have to be careful with the caches. Yes, Alexi? So do you have, do you have data dependencies between um, 0 and 1? So, so, so what you do is you, you, you're forking v naught. It puts the task onto the queue, onto the work queue, and carries on. So um, at the moment, there, there's, there's no blocking happening at all. 
Well, the, the join will wait for the other ones to be finished, but, but what, what, what I mean is you, 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 don't have, um, you don't have a thread idle without actually doing work. Um, so it's all, all eight threads are busy, but they're doing the same work. So what we want to do now is to, is to go to a different place where we're going to, to, to avoid doing unnecessary work, right? Um, okay, so now, of course, remember that, that the, big, the big cost, one of the, the big cost is the top three levels, right? That's where the real big cost comes in. So, the, so by, by avoiding to do the, the small fry, it's not going to get us some, such a big difference in performance, but it will get us something. All right, let's, let's go and, and add this demo four into, into our work. Now, what I wanted to say with caching, um, the challenge is always to, to know when to throw away elements inside the cache. We don't want to have something inside the cache that stays there forever because that's going to give us memory leak. Um, we have to expire things out of the cache. So in our case, we're going to not have a static map. We're going to create the map um, as we go into the method, and then when we finish with method, we throw away the map. So that's basically the idea. Um, OK. So we write a second method that takes as a parameter a map of integer to big integer cache, like so. And um, over here, when we return f, we say comma cache, and f comma cache. And then inside the f over here, we need to say, um, map now, the map's going to be accessed from multiple threads, so what should we use here? Concurrent hash map will work, yes, let's take that. Big integer um, cache equals new concurrent hash map. We're going to seed it with naught comma zero and cache dot put one comma one. And then we're going to say return f of n comma the cache. Right. We don't need the if nor to one. Um, what we do need to do is to say um, big integer results uh, equals cache dot get of n. Now, um, if the result is equal to null, then we need to work out the result. So we're going to uh, do the following. We're going to do this whole calculation. And we're going to say inside the if result equals and result equals, and then we're going to say cache dot put in comma your result, and finally we're going to say return the result. Okay, so we're going to work it out on demand. Now there's a function that, that actually does that for you. Anybody know what that's called? No, I was lying. There's no such function. Uh, <laughs> you're thinking of the right method, but that's a trick question because you, inside a computer, of, uh, inside a computer of absent, you're not allowed to change the structure of the map. If you do that, you end up with an infinite loop inside concurrent hash map. It's a very nasty little feature that they've added, right? And um, and they don't actually document it, at least not in Java 8. In Java 9, they actually tell you that they're going to throw an exception if you do that. But um, it's, it's, it's a very nasty little, little thing that's caught me out. And if you think about it, it, it is kind of obvious, because to try and, and keep everything thread safe um, with recursive updates would be extremely difficult. But uh, they don't actually say that they're not going to do it. They just, ah, OK, we'll just give you an infant loop. Um, so we need to do it this way. Computer for absent won't work. So let's run this again and see if this has improved the situation a bit. Okay, so let's see how long it takes to do 100 million with demo four. And we have improved it a bit. We've gone down to 10 seconds, 10.121 seconds. So that's definitely an improvement. Um, not as much as I was hoping, but it is an improvement. And, and the reason why it's not so much is because, first of all, um, the big ones that are the last few calculations where we're doing these big multipliers. That's where we're spending most of the time. Secondly, um, we still have lots of duplication. Look at this. See, this gets calculated four times. Okay? And it's the nature of this particular algorithm. Um, let's go back to that slide that I showed you. This one over here. 
um, the, the numbers we're calculating are at the same level. So there's a good chance of multiple threads trying to work out the same thing at the same time. All right, so this is our demo four. And let's commit that before we get too happy. Um, demo four. And so the next, uh, next approach I've got is to, instead of putting a big into just, uh, instead, of, instead of just getting and then starting calculation, I, I do something called a reserved um, caching scheme where when I want to calculate it, I, I put a special type of big integer into the map. It's just a placeholder object. It's like a reservation saying, I want to calculate this thing. Um, and, 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 and so I don't, I don't say get, I say put if absent. On, with, with our special object. If the object, if, if already a result is inside there, calculated result, I'm going to get that result back from put if absent. If I get back null, that means that I was the first person to actually call that successfully, that means I can start the calculation immediately. If I get back that special reserved object, that means that somebody else is working on it, I must wait for them to finish before I continue. So uh, let's do that. Let's add this reserved caching scheme. Um, so I'm going to make a special, a special big integer over here. Um, private final big integer reserved equals new big integer. Uh, I always get this wrong. Value of minus 1,000, some negative number to distinguish it from the other numbers. And um, what I now do is, instead of saying get, I say put if absent in comma reserved, and then um, if result is null, okay, I'll, I'll finish that in a moment, else if result is equal to reserved, that means that somebody else is busy working, I must wait for them to finish. So I'm going to do um, this way first, synchronize on reserved, um, while um, result equals cache.get on the n is equal to reserved. As long as it's still equal to reserved, I'm going to wait. It's going to wait for it to be uh, completed or to get notified. Um, I'm going to put a try catch around this, and I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to actually throw a cancellation exception over here to indicate that we were interrupted. Okay? So this is sort of the, the waiting method. I'm saying um, synchronized, um, which, which, wait, which wait, waits on a very specific lock called reserved. And then um, over here where I'm saying cache.put, I'm going to also have a res synchronized on reserved. I'm going to say reserved.notify all, like so. So this is a mechanism where I'm now going to have the threads which, which, are, which are waiting for the results blocked until the other threads are done. Let's run this again and see if this makes any difference. Now, this time around, we should only see every number calculated a single time. That's what we're looking out for now. And I think you can see that if you look at the numbers here for 100 million. Each one is only being calculated a single time. And we've shaved off quite a bit of time by not doing unnecessary work. So we got down by 30%, which is um, if, if you decrease your body weight by 30%, you're probably going to die, right? <laughs> it's actually not a good sign. For, my, for me, it will be okay, but for most of you, it actually wouldn't be very good at all. Okay, so there we go. Um, so here we've got our uh, demo five. And... Um, the results are not bad, right? Not bad at all. Yes, so it's, it's like saying, I'm putting up my hand, I want to calculate this thing. It's actually, it's actually a bit like what we would want to do with Computer for Absent. Computer for Absent should be doing this for us, right? But it doesn't work with recursive updates within the map. So we need to do it ourselves. Actually, there's another problem with Computer for Absent. And that is that if you have relatively few values inside, relatively few keys inside your map and use computer for apps, and you have the most terrible contention you can imagine, it becomes very, very slow. So be careful of that. 
Um, okay, so let's check that in quickly. Demo five. Okay, now, the, the problem that we have at this, with this particular run is at the beginning of the run, you'll notice that um, there are going to be quite a few, and I need to just do this again because I, I just need, this needs some uh, very quick fingers. Okay, so click start, start, and quick do this, and quick do that again, and, and wait for a bit, and click again. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is three different thread dumps. At the beginning of the run, you notice that I've got thread seven is runnable. Thread six is waiting for somebody else to do the work. Um, then five is waiting, four is waiting, three is waiting, two is waiting, one is waiting, and main is working. So two threads are actually doing calculations. And the other threads are all waiting for others to do their, their bit first before they can continue. And, and, you, and with this algorithm, you have it at the beginning of the run, you have this black patch where, um, so I showed you at the beginning of, of my talk, at the beginning, there's a period um, where quite a few threads are blocked waiting for other threads. Once, once the whole system gets started up, once we've calculated a few numbers, that passes. But in the beginning, we have this black period. Um, Fortunately, with this 400 million, it's, it's, the, the total time isn't that long. That's quite a long run. I think that's 1 billion. But 100 million is not that long. So the back period isn't that long, but it is there. And you can see it if you look at the thread dumps at the beginning. The threads are not active. They are sitting idle waiting for others. And that's, of course, always a problem when you're blocking. So the next demo improves that. What we want to do with the next demo is we want to... Um, we want to, to help the fork join put along a bit. And there's this interface called Manage Blocker, which basically allows you to, to implement um, the sort of a, a conditional method, um, the condition predicate and, um, and the blocking part, um, in such a way that the fork join pool can work with it, can actually say, well, we're going to block, but what we're going to do instead, we're actually going to um, create another thread to, to take over from that blocked thread. And there, there are two classes that use it already. The one is called phaser, other one's called completable future. So, um, and, and it's used to keep the parallelism high even if, you, even if you end up blocking. So, let me show you how to do this. Uh, this code here where I'm blocking, we're going to extract that and we're going to put that into a separate class. We're going to have here a a new class, private class, um, it's called a Fibonacci blocker, implements the managed blocker inside the fork join pool class. And we've got two methods, block and is releasable. Is releasable is basically your condition predicate. So it's going to be something like um, return results equals cache.get of n. Um, and if that is not equal to result, to, to reserved, then we know that there's no point in locking. You don't need to lock. It's releasable. So, um, and, and the result is going to be your big integer. It's basically going to be um, this over here. Let me just copy that down. Copy and paste. Um, int n and this. Okay, almost done. Let's mark these as private. And let's make these final as well. And we're going to need a constructor for this. Okay, so we've got a Fibonacci blocker with, with int n, the cache, and the result, which we're going to use to send the result back. Um, and this is, this is basically going to be my, my, uh, my blocking, my condition, predicate, whether or not I can release it. And that gives me, that's going to give the Fibonacci, uh, sorry, the fork join pool, the ability to, um, to, to um, if it's not releasable, to block and to then possibly create another thread to take over the work. Okay, so the, the block itself is going to be this code over here, basically. Um, just move this in here. 
It's going to be synchronized reserved while here just we use other code while not is releasable. Reserve thought wait, and then once I'm done, I'm going to say return true. Return true means I'm, I'm done now, I can, I can exit. Um, okay, so um, the way I'd use it is inside here, inside, inside my if result equals reserved, I would say uh, Fibonacci blocker equals new Fibonacci blocker with n and the cache. I then say blocker dot, uh, I then say uh, fork join pool dot manage block blocker. That's the key. If I just said blocker dot block, then it's going to do exactly the same code as before. And in fact, when I call fork join pool dot manage block, it's going to, to also uh, figure out whether it's running inside a fork join uh, pool thread. And if it is, it, it, it communicates with a fork join pool. If it's, if it's not a fork join pool thread, it just does what we did before, just does a normal block. And um, now we're going to say um, result equals blocker dot results, like so. So um, we got quite good results before, seven seconds. And there is a possibility that maybe my result will be worse. Okay, I'm just warning you because this is a demo. But my sneaky trick of rebooting my machine normally means that it's going to be a bit faster, but we'll see. We'll see. Um, you can see it more strongly with a bigger number. And it is slightly faster, okay, which is great. <laughs> Not enough to, to really get too excited about, but it is faster. Um, pardon, sorry? Um, okay, so you want st the static in a class, I do need... I do actually need some variables, don't I? Or don't I? Do I need? Okay, let's try that static in a class. Yeah, I need the reserved. I can make reserved static as well. So a lot of people worry about the reserve being a bottleneck. Um, you would pick it up as a bottleneck if you find threads on the blocked state. Then that's a bottleneck, but in most, most likely it won't be. So what I've done now to, make, uh, to satisfy our curiosity, I've made the inner class static and I've made the the fields the, the the big integer field static as well. Let's run this again and see if it makes a difference. It's, just, it's pretty much the same. Uh, it's um, yeah, it's the same. So uh, I wouldn't say it's slower or faster for this test. It's the same. I'm going to undo that again because I, I don't really want it static. OK. So this is our demo six. Uh, demo six. Now, um, I've got some homework for you guys. Because this is all fun in games, using a fork join and, and manage blocker. But you can also do the same thing using Computable Future. And what you'd need to do, you, you'd need my big integer that's been hacked, right? You need to get that from, the, uh, f from my repository. And um, I'm actually wondering if it is actually in my repository because I... Good status? No, it's not, you see. I always forget that. Uh, let me add that. So that's something which always gets not so nice. Get commit minus A. Big integer hack, right? So, so what you need to do is you need to actually apply that before. Um, I should have done that before, but I always forget. So, what I want to say is that um, you, you need the big integer hack. But then what you can do is instead of having, you also need a cache, and you need the data sum of square algorithms. So, most of my demo you need. But if you want to try this out, um, you can then take completable futures, create a completable future. Um, the base solution I've seen was by a guy called Roy from, from Amsterdam, and he used then accept both async and complete um, to, to use that rather than having this, this, uh, this reserved um, caching scheme and the managed blocker. Any managed blocking would be done by the computer of the future internally because they can take care of that themselves. So that's a bit of homework for you. Um, an interesting thing to try out with computer of the future is what happens if you turn off uh, the common fork join pool. What happens then? 
It goes faster. <laughs> yeah, I know why you're saying that, but <laughs> try it out and uh, send me your results. So if you're interested to, to sign up to my newsletter, um, there's a link. Or if you have questions, if you want to say, hello, I'm here, I was here. Or if you want to get the, the repository for the, all these demos, you're also welcome to sign up. Any questions? <laughs> okay, besides the, besides the print line, any other questions? Because <laughs> you can try that out, run it and see what it does. Any other questions about fork join or manage blocker? I'm a bit spaced out because I, I've been, I, I started flying yesterday at about five in the evening and I, I flew all the way from South Africa to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to Munich, Munich to Sofia to give you a talk, right? And after this, I'm going to go on the plane to fly to Athens and then home, so to Crete. So if I'm a bit uh, spaced out, that explains why. <laughs> Any other questions? Alexi. Oh, yeah, yeah. Further improvements, absolutely. Yeah, so you can, there's, there are other algorithms you can use. So they're, they're better algorithms than the actual sum of squares. But I don't understand them at all. And um, I, I don't know how easy it is to parallelize them. So I haven't bothered with them. Another, another clever one is to, um, is, is sometimes you, you, have an, you, you, look, you, you need to have n, and you've, you've got, you happen to have n minus 1 and n minus 2 available. So you don't need to do this whole multiply stuff. You can just take the two previous numbers that are there. Um, so there are a whole bunch of other optimizations you can do to make this better. But most of them are on the algorithm side, not on the parallelism side. And that's always where you get the best bet, the best win anyway. Yeah, from parallelism side, it's 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 um, it's. Uh, I don't think you're going to get squeezed much more out of it. Unless you're going to go on to, like, you know, different types of hardware. Thanks very much. I'll be around for a while. Thanks for the talk to me.